Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Frame Rate is brought to you by Pond5, the world's stock media marketplace. If you're a media maker who needs stock video clips, photos, illustrations, music tracks, or sound effects, check out Pond5 for instant downloads at the best prices anywhere. Check out Pond5 at pond5.com. And for 25% off this month, use code TWIT25. And by Squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to create a high-quality website or blog. For a free trial and 10% off your first purchase on new accounts, Go to squarespace.com and use offer code FRAMERATE5. And they now offer free domain registration with annual plan subscriptions. The housing bubble. The auto collapse. The Great Depression. America was able to survive all of these economic meltdowns. But now, it faces its greatest financial threat in 250 years. The Avengers came out, and it took all the money. Here's the situation. There's a finite amount of money in the economy, and the Avengers movie took all of it. So now there's no money left for anyone else. It's just how economics works. In its opening weekend, the Avengers made over $200 million. Within a week, it had grossed approximately all the dollars in the world, <laughs> leaving no dollars for the American people. The Avengers swept in and ate up all of the money, like the Langoliers sweep in and eat up time. Yes! yes. Euros, <laughs> valuable shells. Literally all money is now in the pockets of Disney, Marvel, and probably Robert Downey Jr. Go, 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 go! Avengers, because they have all the money. Actually, it's Frame Rate. I'm Tom Merritt. I prefer to think of us as Frame Rate, a wholly owned subsidiary of the Avengers Assembled movie. I am happy, happy to be a wholly owned subsidiary of the Avengers. I'll bet you are, man. Look, that came out from the folks over at Funny or Die, and uh, it's right. that They made that video just for Tom Merritt. The only thing they left out is the part where they hand you the award for winning this year's NSFW Summer Movie Draft. Ah, uh, we'll see about that. We'll, still, we'll talk about that a little later in the show. But first, the free ride is over, Brian, and that's our first big story. This just in, the big story. So I read this after somebody on Twitter pointed out the press release from Comcast. And it starts off with this great, long, five, six-paragraph explanation of how Comcast tried this 250-gigabyte cap way back in the day when 250 gigabytes work. was yeah, nobody amazing. Liked the caps. It was an amazing amount back then. No one could ever imagine using it, but times have changed, and Comcast understands that you want to watch video online, and 250 gigabytes, while still probably enough for most people, is, you know, is, is not going to be enough for long. So they're forward-thinking, and what they're going to do is start charging you more. Uh, well, you just mean like a higher flat fee, and now we're back to all you can eat. No, and actually, they're and raising the 250 gigabyte cap all the way, Brian, to 300 gigabytes. Oh my god! <laughs> and then, it's and then, almost hey, a Blu-ray. You know, that's that's probably enough for 90 percent of the people. But if you need more, you just pay more for every 100 gigabytes you need. Or actually, is it every 100? I think it's every 50 50 gigabytes. Uh, oh, it's brutal is what it is. I mean, essentially, it's moving. It, $10. It, it, $10 for every uh, 50 gigabytes after that that you need. So here's the, the problem with this entire scheme is that it is predicated on the belief that people who consume more megabytes or gigabytes are using the Internet more. And that's flat out not true. It's the way they're using it yeah. is more bandwidth intensive. And it doesn't necessarily cost anyone anything more. It's just a way to to penalize people who like to watch video over the Internet versus people who like to be chatty Cathy's on Facebook or Twitter or whatever these low bandwidth uses are. I, I don't even think it's meant to punish people. I know that's the, the assumption is, well, Comcast has Xfinity of Video On Demand and they want to force you to watch that. I think they're smarter than that. They're not going to force you 
to go watch Xfinity On Demand. That is a nice side effect that I'm sure they account for. Uh, but I really think it's just about dollars. They want to figure out the way to make the most money off you as possible. And if one of the ways to do that is encourage you to watch Hulu and encourage you to watch Netflix and then get extra money from you because of it, then that's what they're, that's what they're going to do. And that's what this is all about. They're looking at the wireless industry and saying, hey, those guys are, are, are doing great now. AT&T's got this thing where they, you know, they 25 gigabytes. And if you go over, you pay $5, you know, for every, every certain amount over. What? Let's do that. People are used to that. They're accepting that. Let's see if we can get away with that on the cable side. But they're trying to pitch it as this great advance in being able to manage the network and allow you to watch as much as you want and stay neutral. And that's what pisses me off is... I, don't don't try to make me swallow a pill and tell me it's pizza. It's right. not. What you're doing well, is making money off me in a way you think I'll accept. It has nothing to do with congestion. Traffic congestion happens at peak times when a lot of people try to use the, ba- the bandwidth all at once. It doesn't happen all the way over the course of a month because you happen to use 300 gigabytes. It's all about when you use it and when you're overloading the router. The lights blinking don't cost more money. Right. Correct. Well, and here's the other problem, too, is they're trying to sell this line to people who are accustomed to an all-you-can-eat package on cable. They're also accustomed to an all-you-can-eat package on on uh, on Internet. Now, the problem is, I understand, they need to figure out a way to keep their sweet $150 uh, honeypot coming in month after month, and it's not looking good for people who are cutting the cord and taking cable completely out of the equation. But the problem is, is you can't seduce that crowd to you, you can't get them into the idea of using Hulu and Netflix as a replacement for traditional cable and also try to suddenly switch them to a pay as you go. The more you consume, the more we charge you mentality. That is not going to sit well with consumers. And I'm surprised there's not a bigger backlash with, about this. Now, see, what I, would, I, what I would accept is them saying, you know, at 8 p.m. at night, Everybody's trying to use the internet at the same time, and that's when we have congestion management problems, or 12.30 in the day when everybody's at lunch, that's when we have congestion problems. Uh, So during those time periods, uh, we're going to sell you uh, a way to make sure that you get better bandwidth than other people. We're going to sell you an extra track uh, that says you're prioritized, but that would get net neutrality advocates all up in arms. Because you're, you're paying for prioritization. But I don't think it should. Prioritiza- priority access to everything, not priority access to the sender, priority right. access to the accessor, I think would be fine. I, I don't see that as a problem at all because right now nobody guarantees level certain – or they don't guarantee 30 megabits when you sign up for a 30 megabit package. They say up to 30 megabits and, of course, at peak times you're stuck below that. But what they could do is they could sell a package where it's like we guarantee you will never have less than 20 megabits no matter how busy the traffic is. I don't see how that would be a violation of net neutrality in the, in the slightest. It shouldn't be, but I bet it would get net neutrality because anytime you say priority and access in a sentence, all of a sudden it triggers the alarm bells. Uh, but, but instead, what they're saying is, you know, everybody seems to understand. I don't even think it's that insidious, frankly. I think it's like everybody understands paying more for more, so we're just going to charge that way. And it'll have kind of a blanket effect of reducing some congestion, but we'll build out and we're not that worried about it. Uh, but, it but, but they're trying to sell it to us in a way that's, all, that's frankly a lie. Yes. Well, I mean, granted, now there's nothing new about that, but but I would disagree even with the, the base produ- presumption that you're paying more for more. Yes, you are paying more for the actual bandwidth and you are moving more bits, but but people don't buy for bits. They buy for the experience and the experience as far as Internet access is not different, whether it's a, a high bandwidth uh, utility or a low bandwidth utility. And, it, and, and I hate that it's an arbitrary selection that they're going to be like, well, we're going to charge more for, uh, I don't know, how many megabytes, as opposed to as opposed to how many hours you're on the Internet. Or there's any number of other ways to handle the usage and some that would actually treat it as a finite resource when it's not a finite resource. Uh, Meanwhile, in our next big story, the feds are considering doing something to actually help you, the consumer. Stop everything. It's another big story. And when I say the feds, I mean the G-men. You mean the The character? Black suits. (laughs) Coming to your door. Uh, Actually, no, it's the U.S. Copyright Office. Uh, The U.S. Copyright Office, every three years, has hearings about the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. 
that uh, allows to allows them to entertain exceptions. Now, this is the Library of Congress entertains exceptions to the DMCA every year, uh, but the U.S. Copyright Office has the ability to change things in in sort of a permanent way, whereas the Library of Congress has to kind of renew them every year. Uh, for instance, it, the Library of Congress gave a, a, an exemption for jailbreaking phones, for instance. Uh, right. The Library of Congress gave exemptions to educational institutions for ripping DVDs. Uh, so filmmakers, video mixers, and others are petitioning the U.S. Copyright Office for the ability to continue to use DVD encryption tools to copy short clips of DVDs from motion pictures to put into their own films. Because they say, well, look, we have a fair use right. Let's, let's make this Library of Congress exemption permanent. Right. And so and obviously the idea here is they're already covered under fair use. If you're making a documentary about Star Wars, you're able to put a small clip of Star Wars in there and you're protected under fair use. Uh, As we saw with the people versus George Lucas, they used a lot of sound effects and little clips from the movie to make illustrative points in a transformative piece of work. So that part's not not uh, now individual cases. You may or may not be covered under fair use. But the idea of fair use is totally covered. What these guys are saying is in order to physically get a decent extraction, a decent copy of this material to put in my show, I have to break a federal law in that I have to crack the encryption on the DVD in order to make a copy of it to place in my work. Yeah. And the, the counter argument is, well, hey, bro, it's on streaming on, on Netflix. And the, the artist's response is, yeah, but that looks like ass. And you and I both know it. Yeah, or you can just license it from the major motion picture studios, which could be oh, because costly that's, and it's, take years. Yeah, <laughs> um, Clarissa Warrick, general counsel for Warner Brothers Home Entertainment, testified against the decryption measure and had the worst defense. If we didn't have access controls, there might be the same kind of mass piracy we've seen with unprotected music. So many things wrong with the sentence, I don't know where to begin. First of all, we don't have mass piracy with unprotected music right now. Our music is unprotected. And we actually are seeing a resurgence in people buying digital music because they can now know they'll play it anywhere. And there's lots of great places to buy music. And there's new streaming services. Music has never been so vibrant. And it's absolutely unprotected. What we do see mass piracy of, though, is video. And your protection on DVDs isn't doing a damn thing to stop it. Well, and again, this is not a case of trying to create effective legislation or do, or pay attention to the market and respond in a smart way. This is a case where everybody wants to make a move that looks like they're doing something about it. It's a visible reminder that they could point to and say, I did this, and that's why you should reelect me, or that's why I am good to have been appointed to this bureaucracy or whatever. This is, I'll tell you, man, watching The Wire transform my life. I see the whole world differently now. I understand how idiotic decisions like this get made. Exemptions are allotted by the Copyright Office if they are convinced consumers are adversely affected in their ability to make non-infringing use due to the prohibition on circumvention. That seems to be clearly the case in in this particular uh, circumstance. Uh, However, the approved exemptions also have to be sanctioned by the Library of Congress, uh, so they're not expected to finalize any of these approvals until later this year. So we we won't find out for a while whether they do this or not. While we wait, let's talk about yet another big story. Tuck in your bootstraps. It's yet another big story. Actually, this is this is a new segment on uh, Frame Rate called Survey Says. Yeah, got- there's a lot of different stuff. In fact, actually, I should move. In fact, right now, live, I'm going to move a story that I had down in the slipstreams. I'm going to move it up into this so we can talk about it. So you start us off. All right. Uh, yeah, I figured the way we do this, uh, I'll explain the survey and you give me your immediate reaction. All right. All right. Yeah. Uh, Forrester Research says 32.1 million U.S. households now access online video on their TVs out of 115 million households with at least one TV. Uh, game consoles, as we have heard previously, led uh, the way as the most popular way people are hooking up the Internet to their television. So one in three families are watching something not on like whether it's Hulu or Netflix or whatever. They're not watching it in their office or computer room. They're watching it right there in the living room on the TV. Well, I think you're overstating it. One in three actually watch online video on their TVs. That doesn't mean they're not watching cable television or broadcast. Television. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no I, 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 what I'm saying is they're not watching it in the office. They're watching they're, they're watching, watching online it. TV on their TV. Yeah. Right. That that is a huge, huge difference. And I'm really surprised and pleased by that. That tells me that it's time for Hulu to step up and to stop uh, maybe assuming that Hulu Plus is a fringe idea, but instead the way most people want to enjoy their video. 
32.1 million households is a very small number for a cable network. Like, that's, that's not enough to survive as a cable TV network. I remember at, at Tech TV in 1999, mind you, we had something close to 40 million households, and we were saying, we got to get to 50 uh, or we can't survive. Uh, right. And that's okay. probably a I, I, bigger I'm, number now. So understand that here's the difference. Here's the difference is you guys were in 40 million households, meaning that they were able to watch tech TV if they wanted to. It didn't mean any of them were watching it. This the difference is this is not 32 million people able to access online video. This is 32 million people accessing online video. But they're not all is, accessing the same network. No, it's going to no. be my point. With Tech right. TV, we were in 40 million households, which meant every one of those households could watch us. And you're right. They didn't all watch us. 32 million households accessing online video. They're not all watching Hulu. They're not all watching Netflix. So even if you say everybody's watching Netflix in 32 million households, uh, it's, it, you still got a ways to go before we actually have online networks like Netflix and Hulu competing at the massive scale that is needed. But here's where because you're th some of these people are watching YouTube clips and AOL video and et cetera, et cetera. Right. Et cetera. But, but here's where your comparison breaks down. If your evaluation is how many households have access to Hulu and Netflix, which was the comparison you were making with Tech TV, then you've got to count the fact that the majority of people do watch them on their laptops, on their iPads, on their iPhones. So if we're looking at total number of households who have access to these networks, that would be the true comparison to what you're describing. Well, no, actually, it's not a true comparison because. At, it, being in a household on cable TV means I'm I, I'm in a limited selection of channels that people are likely to watch. Being accessible in a house that has the internet means I'm in an infinite number of channels that people have access to. So it, it's apples and oranges. You can't really compare it that directly. Then why did you start the comparison? Because I think there's something valuable to thinking. Okay, 32 million households watching on. If you're saying accessing online video at all, then that starts to narrow it down. You're not just saying, well, they have access to the internet. You're saying, oh, these are people who are actively watching online video, so they're more likely, and to me that's more com comparable to be able to or, or be, to be going and watching a Netflix or a Hulu. So, so if I'm hearing you correctly, you are unimpressed with the 32 million figure. No, you no, feel no, no. I, I, there's nothing emotional in what I'm saying at all. I, I'm, I'm saying okay. is they've got a ways to go before they can actually say, oh, Netflix is as powerful as ESPN, as powerful as Bravo, as powerful as USA Network. But they're getting closer. Yeah, well, I'm going to say that the penetration, it is a very, very big deal to get out of the office and into the living room. And I'm very impressed that a third of all American homes not only have the capability, but are taking advantage of it now. That is a very big step for me. I, I think it's interesting. Yeah, but they're only watching ads. Comscore is the next survey. Uh, video viewing stayed steady to flat in the last survey period from Comscore. But one in five videos watched online last month was an ad. And viewers watched an average of 60 ads per person. So I have a question on this. Does this count viral marketing campaigns? What or do you, is what this do you just... Mean? Well, I mean, is if when you say one in five videos, are you talking about like just a straight up pre-roll ad yes. born like, you know, use Crest? Or are you talking about the stuff that, that blurs the line between content and, uh, you know, like there's there's a, pr a bunch of people have forwarded me that uh, viral video where they did a flash mob with Boy, TNT. You know what? I wish everyone would have to take... Uh, basic statistics and, sur and survey methodology because uh, everyone always wants to pick apart surveys like, well, I bet they didn't account for, for that. No, they count for that. No viral right. videos in there. This is just, this is just. Well, here, here's my point. Here's my point is if that is the case, then that means the figure is even higher as far as the value of online content as an advertising platform. So even more ads are being watched because they're, we don't think of them as ads. I, I would not have believed this until last night when I saw my in-laws sitting down to watch a half-hour primetime television show that was filled with nothing but yeah. other ads from all around the world. And I'm like, well, apparently people love ads. They yeah. love these little vignettes that tell you to buy Doritos. Well, and think about it. Hulu leads the pack. 1.6 billion ads streamed last month, uh, which is actually down for them. But it's because you sit there and you watch six ads when you watch a, yeah. a and and that's nothing compared to what you actually watch on broadcast. You're right. It's crazy. Yeah, crazy. that's a really good point. Uh, MPD says sales of 3D TVs in the U.S. grew 74 percent in units over last year, with 3D TVs accounting for 11 percent of all flat panel sales in the first quarter of 2012. So 3D is is on the rise, right, Brian?
Uh, no, in fact, a genius I know said Tom, named Tom Merritt, suggested that t- 3D TVs are going to be the future because that's just what all TVs are going to be. They're all going to have 3D built in, and this would seem to back that up. Uh, just 14 percent of consumers say 3D is a must-have feature. So they're buying 3D TVs, but they don't really care about the 3D. Who, who is that 14 percent? Who is that one in eight people would be like, "Oh man, I gotta have me that 3D." It, it seems high, doesn't it? Yes, I don't. I don't believe that statistic. That's weird. Uh, and finally, uh, Google Trends explains value of cord cutters to traditional ad buyers. Yeah, this is interesting. Chad, jump over to this, and I want you to scroll down and play the first minute of this video that they have where it's, I, I, I don't know exactly who they're targeting this to, but they partnered with Nielsen, and they basically wanted to explain that there's gold in them, they're hipsters. At Google, we like to help our advertisers understand media trends. These days, many people are watching more video online and cutting the cord from TV altogether. So Google partnered with Nielsen to learn more about viewers who watch less than two hours of TV a day. These light TV viewers turn out to be a very valuable audience. They are young, well-educated, affluent, and more influential than the general population. About 20% of them don't subscribe to cable TV. To find out how often ads reach these valuable viewers, we use Nielsen's online and TV panels to measure total campaign reach. In six cross-media studies, we measured exposure to both YouTube and Google Display Network ads in addition to TV ads. We found that the online ads increased impressions by 27%. Yeah, you probably should have pulled TV ads failed to reach 63% of the light TV viewers. Overall, online ads added 4% incremental reach to the light TV viewers. So anyway, it's more and more and of this YouTube stuff. Increased yeah, the well, you know what? And what this, is, uh, what this is addressing is a big issue that we go over all the time on frame rate, which is you're not counting all the eyeballs. Eyeballs should be eyeballs. If I'm watching House on my television, it shouldn't matter where it's coming from. Actually, it shouldn't matter if I'm watching it on my television. I'm watching it on my iPad. I'm still watching House and I'm still seeing your ads. Well, and that's I, I almost got I almost bristle at the idea that they call these people light TV viewers, because if you want to co- count them as far as video consumers, these same light TV viewers are among the most massive video consumers you're going to get. Yeah, absolutely. Because they're they're consuming it all the time everywhere instead of just sitting on the couch in front of the television. I, and I'll tell you, they, man, they take a bigger ownership of the content that they, that, they, that they consume. And that's part of the reason that, I mean, we've talked about this before. We, on a per unit basis, the value of online advertising, I think, is much, much greater than what you get with television. We're just waiting for that volume to make it more profitable for people to invest in online to video. You know what makes frame rate more profitable? What? Ads. No way. All right, who is it? Is it my favorite? It's Pond5. Yes. Okay. Uh, I, I'm so glad you brought this up because I'm working on a new movie. It's about a robot hipster from Pluto who is it's sort of a fish out of water story. I haven't figured out exactly where he ends up in the world, maybe in space. I don't know. Where should he end up? I just need this last part of my script. I'm going to make a billion dollars. Well, okay. So he's, you got robots, you got Pluto, yep. uh, you got yep. fish, you got water, mm-hmm. you have space, yep. and he's going to end up in Seattle. Seattle, right. So here, I'm just going to go to Pond5.com. Check this out. I just go to Pond5.com. I'm just going to put in Seattle because I haven't decided if it's going to be a radio drama or maybe a, a comic book pictorial. But I just need lots. I need to get my mind around Seattle. Oh, look at this. He could Here's ride a- the monorail, take a look out the window at the skyline. All of this stuff that we're talking about is available for you to use at Pond5.com. Uh, if you're a media maker... <laughs> The world's largest selection of royalty-free stock video. That static you're hearing is actually the road sounds squeaking through Skype. Uh, yeah. Oh, since we started this, I actually physically went to Seattle and I recorded a bunch of B-roll. I no, needed you st- didn't. You went to Pond5.com and you oh, downloaded some stock video that Tom, you now have the right to use in your movie. Tom, nobody's going to know the difference. I can lie. Right. I can take credit for you can, have, you, can have, you can have helicopter shots. You can have all kinds of crazy stuff. You can have sound effects, images, vector illustrations, music tracks. If you're like, wait a minute, if I use music, aren't I going to get sued? Not if you buy it from Pond5. You can download instantly for legal use in virtually any media production. Uh, or whatever it is you want. I don't want to get... Uh... I don't want to get our, our sponsors in trouble, but uh, theoretically, illegal use. If you're running a long con scam and you need to convince an old lady that you physically went to Seattle. Don't do that. And- <laughs> don't, do, don't, don't, no, don't run any long cons. But 
<laughs> because it won't be legal then. But if you have a legal use, you don't have to worry about getting sued because you're using the stuff from Pond 5. And if you're an artist who's actually like, well, wait a minute, I'm the guy who goes out and does these helicopter shots. You know, I have a friend who does a helicopter. I get up there really cheap. I take these great shots. Sell your stuff on Pond5. It's a marketplace. You can upload pro-quality content, set your own prices, and receive industry-leading royalties on every sale. So check it out. Pond5 has a special offer for our audience members. 25% off your purchase this month when you use this coupon code. Don't forget it. TWIT25. T-W-I-T-2-5. Tom, there are two sound effects under Seattle. Which one do you want me to go left or the right? I don't care. Right. Live in Seattle. Live, <laughs> live in Seattle. That's, That's apparently what you... I like that. We are live in Seattle. <laughs> now I owe them a, a, a performance royalty. <laughs> I, I mimic them. Uh, like I said, pond5.com, P-O-N-D, number 5.com. Use that offer code TWIT25 for 25% off. And we thank them for their support of Frame Rate. And now it is time to enter the slipstream. Hulu unveiled their lineup of original and exclusive shows. This ties into our, our, our market audience. What they're trying to do is say, look, we got all these people with access. You know, and as Brian said, the sky's the limit. Anybody with the internet connection can watch, so we're going to put some new stuff out here. Uh, original shows include a movie review show from Kevin Smith called Spoilers. Are you excited about this, Brian? I know you're a big fan. Uh, yeah, no, I am. I, I listen to a lot of Kevin Smith stuff, and I think this is most in his wheelhouse. Uh, one of the things, and, and don't get me wrong, I'm very happy for Smodco's success and the fact that Comic Book Men got renewed for a second season. It, uh, I only watched the first episode, and from what I understand, it got to be less a, a comic book version of Pawn Stars and more letting the personality of, of the folks come out. So maybe I'll go back and try it again. But this, right from the get-go, seems like a very Kevin Smith kind of show. Where, like, my favorite episodes of Smodcast or the one where the two of them just try to remember or describe what they saw in all of an episode of Harry Potter or the Hunger Games or whatever. And I, I, I think this, I, I'm strong potential for this. Let me just put it that way. Up to speed with Richard Linklater of Austin's Slacker fame. Yeah. Uh, and a comedy called We Got Next. Those are the actual originals. They also have some exclusives, uh, including a UK comedy called Rev. A uh, comedy called The Yard, a magic show from Darren Brown, Inside Your Mind. Darren Brown is one of the finest mind-reading uh, performers in all of history. And and it kills me that he hasn't become a success over here in America the way he is in England. They tried a couple of projects with him on sci-fi, and it just didn't take root. But he, meanwhile, his international audience seeing his stuff online has been huge. So I, I actually really look forward to more of this stuff. And uh, the booth at the end is a sci-fi show. Again, those last ones we mentioned are not originals to Hulu. They're exclusives, which means they've, they've aired elsewhere in the world, but not on Hulu in the United States. All right, similar to uh, uh, Lily Hammer. Also, Netflix has launched a new web-based video player. So it's Have you improved. played with this yet? No, I haven't. I haven't either, but it looks really... I, I watch Netflix on other things. I don't watch it on the web hardly ever. Oh really? No, yeah. I've taken to uh, I've taken to having Netflix on while I do other things, which is probably bad for those other things because it probably means I'm not giving my full attention to them. But uh, but I use the web interface quite a bit, Part, and, partially and, because my kids are always monopolizing the Xbox. And what do you like about this new version? I haven't tried it yet. No, you actually. haven't tried it yet either. Well, okay. Of all the times, because and we'll talk about this later, but uh, I got all the Netflix content of Sons of Anarchy, so now I'm on to iTunes. So I'm sure after this, I'll jump back and do it. Netflix has a uh, the new player has a better looking control bar, uh, gives you access to subtitles and season previews, replaces the text menus with bigger icons. Additional episodes of a TV show can be previewed right from within the player, even in full screen mode. Uh, it's more of a light box style. Uh, play, way of doing additional information. So anyway, it, it, it looks slick, looks clean. I can't wait to play around with it. And finally, Verizon just announced today something called Viewdini, which is this great name. But it is, uh, it is a way for you to access any video online on your mobile device in one location. Uh, th th this is one of those things kind of hard to wrap your head around, but everybody's trying to do it. They want to be the place that you go to to search for a show, and it doesn't matter where it's served, right? So yeah. Netflix and Hulu are part of this. 
Uh, Xfinity is also a part of this, of Xfinity On Demand. So if you're a Comcast sub- cable subscriber, you can you, that'll be in your search. And something called M-Spot, uh, if, you, if you've uh, played around with them, are all in here. And they want to add more and more of these providers so that when you say, hey, I want to watch Sons of Anarchy, you don't have to worry about trying to find out where it is. You just type it in and it says, okay, here, you can watch it at this service. Click and play. So they aim to be the dog catcher, the dog pile of uh, of, of but web. only on mobile because it's a Verizon yeah. service, and it's like you know what I want. I want something that does this everywhere. Yeah, well, I, I'm sure somebody's already hard at work with something like that as a crowdsourced kind of thing. Well, Clicker does it to a certain extent. There's a lot of services that do it. Uh, so I kind of think this is. This is weird. I know what Verizon's trying to do. They're trying to say, hey, our Android phones are awesome because you got this Vudini thing on there. But I'm not sure that that's really going to sway me in buying a Verizon phone. Yeah. Your, your coverage, however, might sway me, Verizon, because you have amazing coverage. Let's move on to Tube Tops. Uh, that Vudini announcement was at the uh, cable show, which is going on, and, and there's a bunch of set-top boxes uh, being announced there as well. A uh, new one from TiVo, a transcoder, an IP-based set-top box uh, that works with your TiVo Premier Q, lets you watch both live and recorded TV on additional televisions throughout the house. So instead of buying a whole new TiVo, you just keep recording the shows on your main TiVo, buy this box, pop it in another room. Yeah, so this is like what, like a combination kind of extender slash Roku box kind of thing? Yeah, it's, it's more of an extender. I guess it's sort of like a Roku box because you can get the access to the TiVo streaming content. But, but the idea is that you're streaming things from your main TiVo. So it's not as useful if you don't have a TiVo premiere. Oh, so it doesn't have like apps or the ability to view Netflix or Hulu directly on this thing. Or download it so you can watch it later. No, I think it does, uh, but it works with your TiVo Premier Q. So I don't know if you can buy this alone. Okay. Or, or uh, now, do you? I, I got to assume that you can use the both both of them independently. Like your wife's watching stuff in the living room, so you go to the bedroom and use yeah, this thing. Yeah, I, I, I would assume so too. Sure. But yeah, sure. Why not? They don't say that's, that. That's not what they're pushing. You're, you're asking it's, all the wrong questions, Brian. TiVo doesn't want you to ask those questions. TiVo just wants you to accept that you'll be able to stream things from the TiVo premiere you bought, and you can buy this at retail or through cable by the end of the summer. Thank you, TiVo overlords. Stop wanting to do what you want with your video. I will I will do as you tell me and enjoy. <laughs> Actually, that's, that's probably somewhat unfair. Uh, TiVo's got a whole big uh, press release about this, uh, and and – they're working with TiVo to give their subscribers the content they want on any screen within the home. So, I, yeah, I think you can stream content whether baby someone steps. else is watching it. All of this is baby steps. The consumer devices, they're catching up with where yeah, most uh, no, uh, were yeah, 2001. Broad, broadband delivered content on every TV in the house. This is delivered through the TiVo experience. So, yeah, you can, you can get anything you get over your TiVo broadband on the extender. It just extends your premiere. But I think you have to have the premiere for this to work. Like it's piggybacking off the premiere. You mean like the Russian premiere? You yes. have to actually bring in, I can't remember the name of uh, Khrushchev. You have to bring in Khrushchev. And Gorbachev. Uh, Motorola announced Dream Gallery TV software launching through North American cable companies. Uh, it's an HTML5 based platform that lets cable providers make near instant changes to their user interfaces. Meant to work on anything from televisions to smartphones, but it'll start on set top boxes. And it's just an interface. It's just a way to access whatever is already available on your cable box. Uh, again, they're showing it off at the cable show in Boston. Do not undervalue this, Tom. This is what I've been screaming for. We have a tendency to get too focused in hardware. And if there's one lesson we've learned from the success of iPhone and the reason that uh, Apple's a multi-billion dollar behemoth now is because they understand that at the end of the day, you don't care what's on the inside. It's the it's the parts that you touch that matter. And if they can make a DVR be a pleasant experience, it don't, doesn't make me want to rip my eyeballs out and have to memorize codes for what channels things are on, then I am all for this. This is a big advance. I'm excited. This is exactly what we were just talking about with Udini, except available on everything, including smartphone devices, potentially. At least it's potential. And you know what the other thing about this is, Brian? What? Google just bought this today. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Google's Google's purchase of Motorola just went through today. So now Google owns Dream Gallery. Yeah, man. That's awesome. So maybe we'll see this integrated in the Google TV somehow. I don't know. Uh, I would like to. I would like, uh, man, I, I got to get my hands on a Google TV. And then Comcast has something called the X1 UI. 
uh, which is a similar sort of thing. X1 uh, is for your TV. It, it unifies search and browsing for real-time on-demand streaming and DVR videos. So again, you search for The Office. You pull results that include upcoming shows, shows you've already recorded, last few episodes available on demand, back seasons, anything from the Stream Picks library, anything that Comcast offers you uh, is available through this. So it, it's a similar sort of thing, trying to solve that problem of not having to search around. I got a question for you. Yeah. So one of the things, uh, invariably, you see buzzwords and all this stuff at these releases. It says streaming TV with news and social apps. Now, I understand news. If you want to go ahead and pop in with a ticker, you know, this just says, you know, this just in Obama announces he's emperor of the world. Then, yes, uh, I can understand that. Social apps, I, for the life of me, cannot think of anything that I would want to do, any social anything that I would want on my television uh, that I couldn't, that I wouldn't prefer to have on my smartphone in my pocket as I'm watching. Yeah. Can you think of anything at all? Do, no. you, do you like to share what shows you watch, or if somebody tweets, you want it on your screen, or you just want your pocket to buzz? That was one of the surveys we didn't talk about, is because it was so obvious. Nobody uses apps on televisions. Yes. It's it, <laughs> nobody wants to use apps on television, unless right. you're using the Netflix app, which you're using to watch Netflix. Nobody wants to have social integrated on their actual television. They want to have it on the second screen. But I think this is this is evidence of decision by committee, right? Everyone yep. says, hey, I know social's really hot. I'm in the meeting. How are we going to integrate social into this new product? Oh, well, I guess we can uh, put, uh, put a Twitter app in there. Great, well, great. Now you know, we have social. Now TVs are coming featuring buzzwords. I hear buzzwords are hot. Let's put <laughs> lots of buzzwords. Let's get some buzzwords in there. Let's put the word buzzword in there. And one of the buzzwords we like here on Frame Rate is film foul. <laughs> So, The Verge reported on May 17th, five days ago, that Ridley Scott and Hampton Fancher are developing an idea for a sequel to Blade Runner. Oh my God, Tom, you have no idea how excited I am about this. Uh, and I'll tell you what, I, actually, I have a massive dam bursting with fanboy giddiness that is just held back and my hand is on the, the flusher that's going to just going to let all this fanboy explode and drown entire cities. But I'm not going to pull that until I see Prometheus, because if Prometheus sucks, then it's not good enough that he's going back to the works that truly were the most inspirational to me as a child. It's uh, if, if he's got the goods and Prometheus is rad, then to think that we can have a Prometheus experience with Blade Runner universe again. Boom. That would be amazing. Alcon, Alcon Entertainment, the production company that announced this, said that Ridley Scott originally intended to do a series of films based on Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep by Philip K. Dick. And Blade Runner was just the first, but he got too busy with other projects. Do you think that the Dick estate is going to get any more of this money? Or do you think they're able to say, hey, uh, we paid you for Blade Runner, but really the universe and the visual elements and, and the society we created, that was all our development all you had was the story of of decker chasing down this one particular replicant or do you think that the uh movie company bought all the rights to the book a long time ago and have them locked up and have for years like most books oh is that is that, is that That's really usually what happens yeah a flat fee and then yeah, bo bo books when they start to get popular these days just get bought by by the movie studios and they lock up the rights and they hold on to them like patents like wow. assets and they trade them around like oh well who has the rights to that book let's find out what studio authors estates rarely control this stuff anymore i don't know if that's true of philip k dick i have no idea yeah, i hope i hope they got some at least some kind of percentage because it would kill me if they went on to do another 200 300 million dollar blockbuster and the dick estate didn't get a cent yeah, but of it he's that's dead. why 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 should they get it long after he's dead this is the problem with copyright law this should be in the public domain it's 14 years it's long much longer than 14 years since it's been published Oh, Why is does that, he need a is sinecure? 14 years the, is 14 years 14 the original? 14 years is what generally has been shown to be the optimal copyright protection for providing the most value to society. Oh, well, in that case, screw the dick estate. <laughs> and there's our title. <laughs> uh, io9 has a great roundup of uh, every single new science fiction and fantasy show announced for next season and we will talk about every single one of them no we won't uh, and did, did you get a chance to look through this though i did actually there's a lot of stuff that i like that i'm interested in um i i thought it was interesting that they talked about how bad the cw needs a quirky sci-fi hit now with smallville having gone away uh, i thought the green arrow was an interesting pick for it but it's a it's a fertile 
it's fertile ground because it's a blank canvas for most people. I know that it's a it's a long, well beloved property in the DC universe, but that's all I know. And well, the Green guys- Arrow was was on Smallville. He was an integral char- character on Smallville because they weren't allowed to use Batman, right? And so they basically make Green Arrow Batman because oh, okay. he was he was the guy who didn't have superpowers but was able to use his own technology, and he was a billionaire. Uh, and so he kind of filled that role of, of Clark Kent's buddy. It's so interesting to see the way that people do workarounds to fill certain archetypes when they don't have the actual character that they need. I know that, uh, for example, uh, The Watchmen was uh, – all of The Watchmen, I believe, were based on uh, Golden or Silver Age DC Comics and um, uh, like, like Rorschach – was based on I, I like the question I think his name was I forget what it was but uh, but you know so he develops Rorschach and Rorschach of course becomes this iconic awesome comic book character now of course uh, uh, Flash to the Future Justice League they're trying to to fill this void and they realize that they can't use anything like Rorschach but since Rorschach was based on the question and forgive me if I'm getting the names wrong they bring up they, they're like well we've got the question so they bring him up and they essentially make him Rorschach. Yeah, oh, and uh, Bill Meeks uh, pointed out in the chat room, Smallville's original pitch was Bruce Wayne, and it was about Batman's training. And no kidding. It, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, uh, also, Discovery is planning to make Brian Brushwood incredibly rich. No, 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 wait. Uh, okay. Discovery wait. is putting podcast stars in front of camera. This is the How Stuff Works guys from Stuff You Should Know. Yeah. Uh, and they're, they're getting a chance uh, to do a twice-weekly or, I'm sorry, they already do a twice-weekly uh, comedy show. They're getting a chance to be on television. Yeah, that's fantastic. I thought it was interesting the direction they decided to go for, where they essentially fictionalized their real-life experience, which I think is a safe thing to do. That's similar to what they or similar to an element of what they did in Comic Book Men. But, uh, but hopefully they've resisted the urge to essentially look like everything else out I, there. I mean, I, obviously, you're a contractor with Revision 3, which is now owned by Discovery. Do you see this This is a hopeful sign that Discovery wants to embrace Revision 3? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, it's obvious that Discovery wants to take good content and put it on an appropriate place on a bigger screen. And it's, it's a great opportunity. The dust has settled from the upheaval of new media and or it is settling, and I get the impression that people are willing to take risks again, which means it's a good time to be pitching projects, which, I, I mean, I'll be honest, full disclosure, I've got like seven or eight different TV projects that, that I'm taking out to production companies right now. I'm, I'm excited. It's, it's a good time. All right, let's take a quick break and thank our other sponsor for today's show, Squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to create a high-quality website or blog. Uh, and this May... Uh, it's probably the best time ever to sign up for a new account at Squarespace uh, because not only can you get 10% off when you purchase, whatever you purchase, whether it's a monthly plan, yearly plan, you get 10% off when you use the code FRAMERATE5. But you also, if you buy the annual plan, you get a free domain name. So, so they just lowered their prices now. Uh, they have plans as low as $8 a month. Uh, you get an additional 10% off because you're a frame rate viewer and... You can get a free domain name if you do the annual plan. You've got to try out Squarespace. You don't need to pay anything to try it out. It is fast. It's easy. I use it for Forecast. I use it for Sword and Laser. I use it for United Moon Colonies. It's a great way to make a good-looking website without having to sweat over it. It's reliable, and you can try it for free. You don't need a credit card. You just go to squarespace.com. Brian, give any, any idea. Any idea you got. Just first thing, idea that comes to your head. Oh, uh, cheese. It's, it's a celebration of cheese. Celebration of cheese.squarespace.com. You could have it up like that. Whoa, no credit that? card needed. Just make it. Look, Chad's he making just, it right now. He just made it. Uh, well, that's my idea. Don't steal my idea. Oh, and he put his name on it. Okay, no! that's not cool. Okay. Celebration of cheese is my idea. It's my property. You can't have it. <laughs> but that's how easy it is. You can steal Brian Brushwood's ideas and make a website out of them. Uh-huh. Like that. No! You've got to try it out. Like, don't take our word for it. You'll see the great modules they have for including images and Twitter feeds, the great uh, import uh, tool they have if you want to bring in an older blog. If you just go there and try it out right now, no credit card needed, squarespace.com. And don't forget, if you do decide to purchase the service, use that offer code FRAMERATE5 and get 10% off your first purchase at new accounts. And don't forget about free domain registration with annual plan subscriptions. You get a free domain name. It's unbelievable. Yeah, every time they use that code, every time they use that code, a marching band comes and delivers a gold bar to each of us. And so, uh, please use the code as often as you can. I don't know if that's a, a motivation to use the code. Oh, I are think, you kidding? I think every time you use that code, a marching band comes and throws bricks at us. 
would probably get more people to subscribe. I'll tell you what. They throw bricks at Tom, and they give bricks of gold to me. That's the end. <laughs> I ain't saying you're a gold bricker. But I am saying it's time to check in on the NSFW show, Frame Rate Summer Movie Draft. I am in the lead. Oh my gosh, this is so severe. This is this is going to be the biggest trouncing of all time. You realize, uh, number one, uh, you're going to win. Number two, you also ruined my side bet with Justin Robert Young. Justin Robert Young was mocking all my picks, saying, and we made a side bet for a stake that he bet that the Dictator plus Battleship plus uh, Men in Black plus Dark Shadows all combined would not make $357 million uh, in 33 cents. Uh, I bet that it would make more. But that the Avengers just steamrolling over me this weekend, two of my releases coming out second and third, it's bad news for me. I'm going to have to buy a stake and lose this game. Battleship, $25 million. Dictator, $24 million. Avengers, $457 million. Oh, my gosh. That's just insane. It's I hu- still think the Dark Knight can challenge it, though. No way. No way. Dark Knight, I'm going to go watch the Avengers again. Who wants to watch sad, pouty, my parents are dead, there's no joy in the Gotham movie, when you can go watch beautiful, colorful, awesome America winning? Your your last chance is Men in Black 3, and it's going to have to seriously outperform expectations no, uh, actually, it doesn't. It just has to. It just has to meet expectations. Because right now, really? I'm going to say uh, uh, th- those three movies together, I think, are going to limp forward and make another fifty to seventy million. So I'll be at mm, hundred and seventy million. But expectations are that Men in Black has to make uh, is going to make two hundred to two hundred eleven million dollars. But all you have so- left is Men in Black. Th- oh no, you have Madagascar. I tell- okay, I see what you're saying. Madagascar is going to make a nice chunk of change for you too. So Madagascar and Men in Black Three have but to Men make three hundred like- million for you to stay in this, and that's possible. Right, right. Well, and I don't even care about winning the game now. I just want to min- win this side bet with Justin Robert Young. I want a free stake for Momo. Men in Black 3 will do well. I, I think it's going to do very well. And it's out this week. That's our, our movie that's coming out this, uh, this weekend, if folks are interested. It looks good. Uh, it has your original cast with Tommy Lee Jones, but it also has the back-in-time cast. And, of course, Will Smith plays himself in – or not himself, but his, his part in both – no, it's like let, let's face it. Every time Will Smith's in the movie, he's, he's playing himself. Yeah, That's yeah. he only has the one role. He's very good at it, though. He is. All right, it's a very talk. convincing Will Smith. Let's check in on what we're watching. What we're watching? Uh, well, I just finished Sherlock, and may I say, I am very upset that I can't keep watching Sherlock. I know. Loved it. No, and you're like it's going to be forever till there's another one. Now you'll get that. Now, how do you feel about Elementary coming out? The U.S. Oh yeah, you know we should have mentioned that when we were talking about the sci-fi shows. CBS has a show called Elementary, which which has a Sherlock Holmes and a Watson in it, and it's a reimagining, and it looks totally like a ripoff. That doesn't mean it'll be bad, but no. it's not going to be the same. I mean, these guys, Stephen Moffat. Uh, first of all, Stephen Moffat. Uh, executive producer of Doctor Who, longtime writer for Doctor Who, his fingerprints are all over that third episode. I right. mean, all the 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 little graffiti things in the background that are sort of alluding to the main plot but never get called attention to. I don't he did even... that all through season one. I mean, he and 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 uh, um, I'm sorry, uh, Russell T Davies uh, did it all through season one with Bad Wolf uh, I for not Doctor even Who. Just that man. No, that's no, a... yeah, but I'm just saying that's the kind of thing that he has done before. And I saw that, I'm like, oh, that's so brilliant. So, so should we move some discussion of that last episode over to the spoiler zone? Uh, yeah, for sure. We should probably uh, stop talking about this, uh, along with Game of Thrones, which we have two more episodes of. And I want to check Uh-oh. in. Uh, just, just without spoilery, uh, has your opinion changed for the better or worse or the state oh, of the no, no, no. I am, I am way less worried than I was. You are? And okay. Let me make it clear. I didn't jump to conclusions. I'll, I mean, there's a difference between – I'm not saying it was bad. I'm just saying – I was saying that I was getting worried as it got farther and farther off track. But I'm less worried now as I see it really has just snapped right back into place now. Now, that's funny because this episode I felt like treaded water, this, this, pre, this, this week's episode. I'm like, it was good. I enjoyed it. But we didn't move. We didn't go anywhere, and I know why. Because Blackwater, the battle, 
is the next it's episode, gonna, no. and that's just uh, sucking all the air out of the room right now. They're like, no. no, we can't do anything until we get to that episode. So we have to set all the pieces in place for that episode, and I can't wait for next week's episode. Well, this was this episode really was, you had all of these kind of disparate uh, directions going in, in all over the place. And this really was the case where this whole episode, they pulled back the slingshot, and they gathered up everything, and they set it all in there, and you felt like you were ready for the ride of your life. I am so stoked for the night. And you saw, I'm sure you watched the scenes from the upcoming episodes and the teaser for for the oh, next, yeah. next oh, week. Oh, yeah. I cannot wait. It's all it's all the battle next week. That's all we yeah. get. And that's all yeah. that's all I want. You need an entire episode devoted to that. Uh, that's going to be fantastic. Uh, oh yeah, I got to add another one. I forgot to put in here Cora. Do you realize that 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 Legend of Cora is like the magic half hour for our family. Every Sunday morning we all gather together and we watch with bated breath. It is so much fun, That's so cool. good, so mature. It, it's it's magic. I haven't had a television experience like that with the whole family in uh, half a decade. That's extremely <laughs> rare. That's re- that's really cool. Um, and also, uh, I've I've been uh, gathering around with my family and watching Mad Men on Sunday evenings. <laughs> it's actually really good this season. They 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 they've captured lightning in a bottle. Uh, it it it's uh, it, again. I know you're you you haven't really gotten going with Mad Men, uh, but for those who maybe I have been watching it or, or haven't quite caught up with the season, catch up uh, if you're into it. Because if you like Mad Men, maybe I will. they're is, at the is, top of their game right now. Is Mad Men on Netflix now, on instant streaming? I I'll believe so. I want to if say is, yes. Yeah. If it is, I will plow straight through it because that's one that my wife has no interest in, in so I don't have to wait for her at all. Let me actually, I'm going to look this up right now. But uh, speaking of which, I... Uh, got caught up. Oh, look, yeah, they do have it on Insta, Insta streaming. So I'll get caught up on Mad Men. Uh, I finished up everything on Sons of Anarchy. I watched all of the Netflix episodes. And let me tell you, man, first three seasons were good. You could tell it was trying to be something, but it was, you know, you could think of examples of stuff that was better. Uh, it reminded me a lot of things I like about The Shield. And in fact, some cast members of The Shield show up in it. Uh, but the the fourth season uh, minor spoiler, something happens at the end of season three and season four picks up uh, a considerable time later. So it's a sort of blank canvas and you're starting all over again. But now, you know, this cast of characters, season four was phenomenal from beginning to end. It was electric. I understood exactly all the characters motivations. I agonized with the decision they had to make. And it ended with a awesome, awesome ending uh, can't say enough good things about uh, season four of Sons of Anarchy. And in fact, uh, I didn't know that iTunes was doing this. When you when I went, I'm like, oh, I, I want to watch, but I don't want to wait. So I went to iTunes and looked up Sons of Anarchy. It was like whole season on HD for $34. I'm like, I'm not paying no $34, but I will pay $3 just to watch the first one. I'm like, oh, well, I'll pay $3 more, watch the second one. I'll pay $3 more, watch the third one. Uh, and then at some point I look up and they had, they change real time, the cost of the season based on how much money you've spent so far. It applies it all towards the season. So finally I look up and it's like, remainder of the season, only 14 bucks. I'm like, all right, fine. And so I bought the whole thing. I thought that was a very smart move on iTunes behalf. Yeah, it's, it's good they've, they've got people to, to do that. And I, I, we both put Diablo 3 down in what we're watching because it is kind of <laughs> like watching a, a movie. Uh, the story's okay, uh, but the gameplay is fantastic. I, I love Diablo 3. I'm having a great I'll time. I'll tell you what. You know what I love the most is that if you play the female uh, wizard, yes. the voice actress is the same voice actress who plays Azula in Avatar The Last Airbender. Ah. And so the whole time, every time she's like, my power is infinite. I'm picturing, uh, I'm picturing Azula. That's a lot of fun I for me. I am guided by prophecy. Exactly. <laughs> All right, let's check some feedback before we get to the spoiler zone. Now it's time for feedback with Brian and Tom on Fame Radio. Yeah. Nick, in the great town of Austin, Texas, says, uh, what's your take on this? I'm a cable cutter of nine years and a Game of Thrones fan. What about paying someone who has cable but no HBO and having them sign up, then using their HBO Go account to watch? Now, this is an interesting one because obviously that's not... I don't even know if it's illegal, but but it's definitely not in keeping with the it agreement. It certainly breaks the terms of service for you to use someone's account to Correct. access... 
Uh, it's probably not illegal. It, you could probably just get their account canceled if they caught you, but they're not probably not going to catch you either. So, so, so it's like breaking the rules of a game. So it's, uh, but, but as far as ethical goes, like, do if what you want and all you want is HBO, do you have a ethical obligation to also pay ESPN for content that you will never watch to be available? Well, like, uh, yes, like, you, you sort of. I can make an argument. I don't think it's unethical for him to do this, though. Let me just say that. But the ethical argument is, HBO has a value proposition with the cable companies to carry them at a certain price because to get HBO, you have to pay the cable companies for the other channels. HBO conceivably would cost more if they didn't have that value proposition exchange with the cable companies. They say, look, cable companies, you can have this cut of what we make because you're going to make this much X on getting people to subscribe to your service. Whereas okay. if it was cable companies provide HBO without providing anything else, the cable companies might say, great, well, we need a higher percentage of the money you're making. I would counter by saying that the equivalent is that your neighbor, your next door neighbor has a, uh, a uh, I don't know, a rake that he never uses. He's got the rake. He already paid the rake. The rake manufacturer has received their money for the rake and it will never be used. It's sitting in their garage. If you come and say, hey, can I give you five bucks? I don't wanna, I don't wanna pay the whole cost of rake, but you know, uh, well actually then you'd be renting it for the other. But the point is th that HBO is being paid and the cable company is being paid. And uh, so, so they're covered. Nobody's being well, lost. it's that argument of a lost sale. And that's why I think it's probably ethical, which is technically, if you follow the rules, the cable company says, well, no, you're taking money away from us because what you should be doing is subscribing to cable and then buying HBO. And so we're not making money off of you because you're not subscribing to cable. That other guy would continue to keep his cable subscription whether you have HBO or not. So you're robbing us of a cable subscription would be yeah, their I, argument. It, okay, now, I, I think the ultimate... I think the ultimate answer would be if you were drinking a beer with with HBO head of, you know, CEO and you say, hey, would you rather I just didn't watch your show? or Would you rather I gave you 10 bucks a month for a subscription and watch it on my friends? I think individually they would want you to do it. And that to me, it, it, regardless of policy and general agreements, it seems to me like that's the, the real test for for the ethicalness. Well, I, I don't know whether the HBO executive would say that or not. He may, might say, no, you got to follow the rules. That's why we have rules. Otherwise, we'd just let you buy HBO directly, and we don't want you to do that. So, so buy your stupid cable subscription and stop ripping me off. When, I'm, All right. I, I could conceivably see an HBO executive. I'm sorry, it. sir. I can't hear you over the sound of BitTorrent. You should say, I'm sorry, sir. I'm not buying your beer anymore. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm stiffing you with the tab. Uh, Josh writes, hi, Tom and Brian. I haven't been able to see Game of Thrones since I can't get HBO with my current financial situation, and I haven't read the books yet since I hate starting with un an unfinished series. I was on a popular news site with curated headlines, rhymes with dark lot bomb. I guess he's saying fart.com. Uh, and they had a blatant spoiler in one of the headlines about someone who dies in the first book and first season of Game of Thrones. I was a bit peeved and sent them a complaint, and they told me that since the book came out 15 years ago, I had no reason to complain. Should I be mad, or was this a fair spoiler? When is long enough for spoilers to be okay? To, uh, to be okay? Uh, I actually, I think we could guess what we the We ran that video, is. remember, of telling you when it's okay to spoil? That's what I was about to say. I actually think that as much as that was intended as a joke, I think they nailed it. I think, you know, two weeks for a, uh, you know, depends on the situation. They, they laid out all these jokes and uh, these rules, like if it's been, if it's a, if the season is still ongoing, you've got this amount of time. If it's a finale, oh. you've got two weeks. I remembered the spoiler that I was alluding to earlier today. Oh, Dr. Good. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. To say like, oh, he's like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde is a spoiler of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, which does not reveal the nature of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde until the end of the book. No kidding. Or later in the book. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But we all know, and now I'm like, I'm like, I don't want to spoil it now. Just in does, case. does that take it away? Like, there's how how on earth could you possibly read Doctor Jekyll and Mister Hyde and not and have that be? So was it a twist at the end for, for the original readers? Yeah. Oh man, it was like what? Chad's like, no, don't spoil me. No, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, uh, finally, uh, we got uh, Jeff Smith, uh, who says, uh, I need your help. I was set to watch the finale of Sherlock tonight when, to my horror, 
I saw my DVR failed to record it. I dashed to the internet to try to find when it would be rebroadcast, either on PBS or BBC America. Alas, I could find no information on this. Do you have any knowledge of when I might get a second chance to watch this episode on television or computer? If the answer is no, then Brian Brushwood, we need to talk. I think that's a, a that's an allusion to uh, how I may or may not have seen Sherlock when it was only available in Europe. But when you flew to the UK, I, I uh, you I can would... buy Sherlock series two on uh, iTunes right now, uh, and it is in fact the the full versions. The P- PBS cuts a little bit out. Really, First, I have no idea why they're freaking PBS, but they still they edit it down. You can watch uh, the full uh, full shows. On iTunes, twenty dollars for all three episodes. It's a little pricey. It's like seven bucks an episode, or twenty dollars for for all three. Man, I'll tell you what. I don't regret giving uh, two dollars. I I hate owning crap that I'm never going to watch again. I hate that I have to buy it instead of just pay one dollar to rent it for for a lot of this content. However, a lot of this stuff is so good. I don't begrudge one second of sending three bucks over to the folks who made Sherlock. Now, that is Rabbit amazing. Badger says that he's able to watch Sherlock on his local PBS website. So you might want to check that out, too. See if you can do it that way. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Rabbit Badger. And thank you all for watching or listening. We're going to do a quick spoiler zone here after the end of the show. Uh, But if you aren't wanting to be spoiled about Sherlock, then by all means, stop watching right now. And email us anytime you like. Uh, Framerate at twit.tv. Find us on the web on demand anytime you like at twit.tv slash fr. And, of course, you can find us live on Tuesday mornings at 10 a.m. Pacific on live.twit.tv. We'll see you soon. In the future. In the future. Silent Green is people! Jekyll and Mr. Hyde are the same person. So I want to, (laughs) I think that should be the new intro to the spoiler zone is saying that. Uh, I actually want to kick things off with a double spoiler. This is, this is one, this is so spoilery that you should only listen to this if you've read the Game of Thrones books. Uh, it'll only take about uh, 30 oh, okay. seconds. Okay, so, so I said Sherlock at the end of Frame Rate, but if you don't want to be spoiled on Game of Thrones, then be careful. Okay, go ahead. Right, right, correct. Uh, we got this letter that I want to read here that does have Last spoilers. Show. All right. Hi, uh, uh, this is from Sean. Hi, Brian and Tom. I wanted to respond to Brian's criticisms or concerns from last week after the latest episode aired. I think Brian may feel better now. I do. But I would like to add my two cents if that's okay. I agree with Tom that we have to let the remainder of the season play out before making plot assumptions. And again, I wasn't making assumptions. I was just expressing my nervousness. Each character has a major plot point in Clash of Kings. I feel the writers have made some changes in the road to get to these plot points, but they themselves remain the same. Some examples. Jon Snow, he needs to kill Halfhand and join the Wildlings. They made Jon and Ygritte interact a little bit more before Jon receives his orders from Halfhand, but I think that adds to why she defends him and will mean more for the future relationship. I buy all of that. Daenerys, go into and burn down the House of the Undying. Concerning Daenerys, her story in the second book was pretty dull outside of the House of the Undying. She just wanders around Karth asking for ships and aid. In the TV show, they needed to give some intrigue to her storyline, so I think the stealing of the dragons works. She now has a huge incentive to go in and a bigger one to burn it down. Uh, Arya uh, learns of Valor Morgalis and escapes Harrenhal. Uh, I love what they did with the Arya storyline. So do I. That's me. Um, in the books, there was so much inner dialogue that it would be difficult to translate to the show. Uh, the actors are great. With with uh, uh, she's a my and that's all the time we have, everybody. Thank you so much. No, 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 no. This, this is all really good stuff. He's exactly right. Is what I'm trying to say. Um, uh, he goes through everything and he says, he, uh, "I think they've set up." Major plot points pretty well for the final two episodes. In reality, Song of Ice Fire is big and complex. Blah, 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 blah. Anyway, uh, all of this, it's a longer email than we normally read, but I think it was dead on the money. He did a really good job of explaining what they needed to hit and and why it didn't matter if they took a a shorter journey to get there. Good. I like that. Yeah, and I I 100% agree. I also like, uh, and he probably mentions this, but I like the flip-flop where we actually aren't seeing the phrase and the original negotiation over the twins and the use of the bridge. We just know that he's been promised to marry someone else, and we're getting to see the story that we didn't get to see in the book of of the lady in the camp, which I think is awesome. No, I, I I agree. I, th- I think it's I think it's good. I think I think all of this is is serving to provide a richer experience in general, and I'm very excited for it. 
Uh, Sherlock, last episode. Uh, okay. Well, first of all, let's talk about the first episode real quick. How great! I, I would say out of all of them, what, what's it? Uh, a lady, Belgrad, something? Belgravia. Yeah. I yeah. Think. Uh, I think that may be my favorite thing uh, Sherlock related in all of history. It's phenomenal. The, the if you haven't seen a single bit of Sherlock, spend the money right now to go watch the first episode of the second season because I thought it was awesome. I thought the last episode was better. Actually. Really? Yeah. I I just I was on the edge of my seat the whole time. It's Moriarty and Holmes. It's brilliant. Uh, to see that banter. And the, what I loved about the first episode was that banter between him and the Lady of Belgravia. Uh, and so seeing that, it's, it's sort of like you kind of need the first one to get your prime for the last one. Uh, right. At, and in a way, they go hand in hand. Yeah, well, well you, see, you see Holmes's weakness for the dance with an intelligent person, and you understand his obsession with, uh, with playing Moriarty's game. And by the way, I was not a fan of Moriarty right at the beginning when you first see him, but man, was I by the end. They... they they killed it. Uh, I well, love it. And they their- keep you guessing. It is not a show where you can say, oh, well, obviously, this is what's going to happen. Because it's going to be, they're going to misdirect you into thinking that you know what the obvious thing is not going to happen. And then they make it happen anyway, but not in the way you expected. Uh, and, and, of course, right from the beginning, and this is a huge spoiler, but it's also a spoiler that you see within the first few minutes of the third episode. So right from the beginning, you hear Watson say, Sherlock Holmes is dead. That is taken from the books. Sherlock Holmes does oh, really? does die, quote unquote, in the books. And so I already knew what was going to be happening by the end of the show, but how they were going to get there, I had no well, idea. Liked, and that's what the brilliance of the show is. I liked the nod. Uh, I think it's in that third episode where they keep referring to the stolen painting. And the name of the painting was the, the location. The painting was of the location where in the books he died uh, uh, in the fall with Moriarty. Yes, you right, right. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, likewise... I thought it was really interesting. We speak a different language visually now when it comes to our television and movies where it, when the book came out, there was no question that he definitely died and that was the end of the book. And then later on, more Sherlock Holmes stories just showed up and they sort of shrugged their shoulders like, I don't know, did he die? Did I die? Well, you thought I so. I I didn't. And, that's, and so to speak that same language, when you watch this, this final episode of season two, there is no question that Sherlock Holmes dies. You watch his body fall to the ground. You watch his head get dashed open and blood flowing out all over the street. This is not one of those guys like, I don't know, did he die, didn't he? It's like, no, he definitely, definitely died, which makes it all the more, like, they overstate the fact that he definitely died and this is not a trick or a trap or anything. Well, no, they they totally told you it was not a real a real death because he asked Molly to help him because he thinks he's going to die. Molly helped him figure that out how to make that happen, how to make it look right. Molly was his inside inside woman in the medical industry to, to give him what he needed to pull that off. Also, Moriarty's not dead either. Okay. Well, wait, but, but he, he, he eats a bullet, doesn't he? Oh, right in his oh, Or does he? See, this Some is... Some people the... swallow swords and eat fire too, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> this is it's just interesting that they go so overboard with the graphic nature of the deaths to because they understand that any ambiguity, any yeah. kind of not showing the audience will imply like, oh, we're playing a coy game. Whereas like to graphically show it, I, I don't I can't think of another show that's gone out of its way to really seriously convince you that they're definitely dead and, and the, then take back seats like that. The key point is that uh, when Watson is running across the street, he gets hit by the bicyclist. Oh, and that's when he misses whatever. That's when he this- misses whatever it is that's key to making to Sherlock able to pull this off. Yeah. Well, I, do you think they'll ever explain it? I bet they won't. I, I would just say. Oh, I, yeah, I think so. I think the next episode of the next season, the first episode of the next season, they're going to have to explain it. Yeah. All right. Well, actually, they're not going to have to explain it. They're going to have to reveal. Well, because they already know, they already reveal. I mean, they'll I have mean, to, they're be- have to reveal it to Watson. Uh, yeah. But they they probably will explain it in the in the third episode of the next series. That's my yeah, guess. I can see that. Uh, regardless, fantastic show. So excited to see more of it. I hate that there's only that. There, I mean, I can't let myself think about it as a TV show because then I get mad that there's so few of them. I just think of them as as three movies instead. Yeah, they are. They are. They're short movies. You're absolutely six, right. Six movies, yeah. So, yeah, exactly. Because you do kind of feel like, oh, man, there's only three. And Eileen was saying, well, it's actually kind of six because they're long. But if you think of it as movies, like they've made six Sherlock movies now, that's impressive. 
That's yeah. Well, and, and I'll tell you, if that's what it takes to get the quality of performances and the quality of execution that they get, then I'm okay with it. I'm okay with it. Oh, it's it's everything too. The performances of the actors, the shooting, uh, the the visual style, and the storytelling. The storytelling is incredible. No, b- yes. Both visual storytelling and and the uh, and the script. Uh, always keeps you guessing. I mean, that that's the thing is you really have to watch close and be like, wait a minute, that bicyclist going by, that's important. Every single scene is important in this show. Yeah. No, it's fantastic. You're, you're Stop talking. I'm about to leave and go watch Sherlock again. I know. Me too. All right. Is there All anything right. else to talk spoiler about? I guess those are the only things uh, that are... Well, yeah, we talked about Game of Thrones. We talked about Sherlock. I think, I think that does it. Uh, so thanks, everybody, for watching or yeah. listening. Twit.tv slash FR. We will see you there if we don't see you next week. Or both. We won't actually see any of you. You'll no. see us. We don't it's really have a eyeballs. Half you we've never met. Most of you. No, I met, I met like about 8,000 well of them. I met, met a few. <laughs> <laughs>